time for him. Uh, and Danny Nicoletta, who ran the camera shop, snapped that photo of him. Um, and then behind me, you can see a couple of the different productions of uh, Ape, uh, which was the play we did to raise money for marriage equality. Oh, cool. So you see, if you can see in that picture, you can see everyone from, you know, George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Kevin Bacon. And we had quite the cast. Oh, fantastic. But I'll point out here for those who know, this was the cast in New York, which also has like Morgan Freeman and, and uh, some really wonderful people. But right here is Larry Kramer. Wow. Uh, who oh. just passed away. Um, you know, obviously with ACT UP was one of the great activists of the past century. And, um, and, it, and he showed up on stage and, and, and was an actor for a day with us. Hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Well, it looks like we're live on Facebook. So um, everyone, if you want to go share uh, the video from Democrats Broad, we would love to have you uh, share the live stream on your Facebook page. Make sure a lot of people can see this call. Um, and uh, thank you very much, Dustin. We're, uh, we're going to get started. I'm going to just read my welcome out and um, we'll take it away. So thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Julia Bryan. I'm the global chair of Democrats Abroad, and I'm joined by Robert Platt, who's the chair of the LGBTQ Plus Caucus for um, DA UK, Martha McDevitt Pugh, who's the co-chair of the Democrats Abroad Global LGBT Caucus, as well as our very special guest, American screenwriter, film producer, and LGBT activist, Dustin Lance Black. Um, and before we uh, kick into everything, I just want to thank you all for who, who have donated and, uh, to attend this event. Really, it's, it's been so great, and we've raised enough money to support calls to over thousands of um, potential voters this year. Getting in touch with potential voters really helps make sure they know how to vote, that their vote counts, and um, you know where to go for more help in case they are um, slightly confused, which you know can sometimes happen. So now I'm going to ask uh, Robbie and Martha just to say a few words and introduce themselves. The two of them have put together this event today, and it's a joint production of um, our two caucuses, and we really appreciate their outreach. So go ahead, Robbie, take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. I, I'm Robbie Platt. Uh, so as, as um, Julia kind of introduced, um, I'm the chair of the Democrats Abroad UK LGBTQ plus caucus. I'm also a member of the executive committee for Democrats Abroad UK. I'm originally from the great state of New York, uh, but I vote North Carolina. And I just want to say that I'm really pleased that all of you could join us today. And particularly, I'm looking forward to hearing again from Lance. Uh, a few of you may remember or even even have attended an event that we held with Lance in London last September where he spoke to our group about his new book, uh, Mama's Boy. Uh, but today I'm, I'm super keen to hear more about his political activism and his feelings specifically around the 2020 election. And perhaps even more importantly, what he feels each of us can be doing to make a difference um, from his role as an activist. These last three and a half years have been extremely challenging for all of us, but particularly, I think in the last 12 months that that's accelerated, we have seen so much of our democracy cornered and abused in ways that we never even thought possible in the USA. Um, it's overwhelming, but it's so important, I think now more than ever, to keep our activism and our energy levels up. And for this reason, I am really pleased that each one of you is here today and uh, to hear what Lance has to say. Thank you. Martha? Okay, thanks, Robbie. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining today from all around the world. So as Julia said, my name is Martha McDevitt Pugh. I'm the co-chair of DA's LGBTQ plus caucus. And I'm also one of DA's eight representatives on the Democratic National Committee and a member of the DNC LGBT uh, caucus. Um, I met Lance in 2016 at the Convention of Philadelphia. Um, and he spoke very powerfully about what's at stake for our community and our country. Um, as one of us, as an LGBT American abroad, I was really keen to get him to join us for an event. So I'm really glad that he's been able to do that today. Um, and also that he's been able to join a live event with DAUK as he lives in London. Um, and with the Milwaukee Convention going mostly virtual this year, it's really great to have Lance here today. And it's one of the ways we can bring the convention to you in 2020 to inspire you and give you the opportunity to learn all, all the things that you can do to make a difference in this election. Um, if you were at the LGBT caucus at the Democratic National Convention, you'd hear from a whole array of national, state, and local elected LGBT leaders and allies. And you'd really walk away knowing how important it is for all of us to vote all the way down the ballot from president to governor to city council, regardless of where you live, in a red or a blue or in a swing state. And you'd really leave inspired to do everything you can between now and November 3rd to have Democrats win, which is why we're together today. 
And um, speaking of local races, Lance, for me, is a teller of the stories of LGBT lives. And thanks to his award-winning film, Milk, you all know who Harvey Milk is. And he was a local down ballot candidate and one who lives on as an inspiration to LGBTQ people around the world to come out, to be themselves, and to step up and even run for office. Um, I myself am from San Francisco, where Harvey Milk was an elected member of our board of supervisors. Um, and uh, so it means a lot to me that that story is now told and is part of our history and part of our cultural heritage, thanks to, uh, to Lance's film. Um, and, uh, I, you know, just to get started, I want to just acknowledge that gift that Lance has given to our community with his powerful storytelling and thank him for taking the time today to be with us to talk about the election. Julia? Well, thank you. Thanks so much. And I'm, I'm really honored to be able to introduce Lance. Um, you know, I, I remember hearing about Harvey Milk when I was in San Francisco with Martha and um, being able to like learn more about his story through what does, Lance's stories have been, has been a really amazing part of that um, experience. Um, you may know Lance as the winner of an Oscar and two WGA awards for his screenplay Milk, which is the biopic of activist Harvey Milk starring Sean Penn. And we've just been talking about that. He was also a founding mem board member of the American F Foundation for Equal Rights, which successfully led to federal cases for marriage equality in California and Virginia and put an end to California's discriminatory Proposition 8. In addition to his creative work, Lance is one of the co-founders of the Uprising of Love Coalition that seeks to raise awareness of violence and discrimination committed against LGBTQ plus people in the global community. Lance also served three years on the board of the Trevor Project, which is a, a national LGBTQ youth crisis hotline where he established a hotline in Harvey Milk's former camera shop on Castro Street in San Francisco. And in 2009, he was also one of a handful of organizers of the National Equality March, where he demanded full federal LGBTQ equality before an audience of over 200,000 dem demonstrators on the steps of the nation's capital. Lance currently lives in London, and he's married to Olympic diver Tom Daly. Great. Thank you, Julia. And now uh, moving on to the questions that we have for Lance today. So Lance, thank you very much for being here. Um, just to give our listeners a bit of an introduction, can you tell us a little bit about how you uh, first got involved with political activism and how that got um, you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. I mean, thank you guys for having me uh, so much. I hope, I hope this is the first of many things we can do to get people living abroad to vote. I mean, that's really the most powerful thing anyone here can do is to vote themselves and second to get other people to vote. Um, and, and second, I'll just apologize because yes, I'm married to Tom and, and right now he's trying, I can hear him, to put our son to bed by himself. And that is no small task. So you're probably gonna hear all kinds of chaos in the background and forgive me. The, um, I, I, my, I think the road to activism or, or even being politically active, you know, Robbie, Martha, Julia, like I'm, we, we've, anyone listening, it starts somewhere in your own personal narrative, doesn't it? It starts somewhere in your gut. And, you know, for some people I, who I grew up around as a Texan, as someone from the South, I, I saw people who seemed to be voting because they wanted to protect something that was theirs and wanted everyone to stay away. I, that was not my experience. My experience was not that I, we needed people to stay away, that there was somehow a lack of things. My experience was watching my mother. In fact, it wasn't a gay experience at all. It was watching my mother and the way that she was treated because of her difference. Because my mother had barely survived polio, which meant she had extreme scoliosis. She was paralyzed from the chest down. And because of that, people assumed certain things about what she could achieve or not achieve. She was told by the nurses in the children's hospital she lived in, in New Orleans, that she would never have a job. She would never have children. You know, and, and that's just not who my mother was. They were labeling her, putting in, her in a little box based on their assumptions of who she was. And it just didn't feel fair to me. And I watched her have to fight that her entire life, to fight not for an advantage, but just an equal shot. And yes, it was inspiring to watch what she did, despite the challenges against her, to watch her go on to run one of the, one of, if not the, most esteemed laboratories in the United States government at Walter Reed Army Medical. 
And yes, I'm proof that in fact, she got married and had the three children they said was medically impossible. I then seeing that injustice, seeing people being treated differently in society and under the law because of their difference, instead of watching a law be crafted that would level a playing field, that would create equal opportunity, that would fulfill the promise of a constitution. Uh, I then started to see by the age of six, when I realized I had a crush on the boy down the street, not the girl down the street, I then realized I was also a part of another group that people would make assumptions about, that people would say, well, you are less than in these ways, and I would have less access to opportunity. You know, at, in, until very recently, it meant I would be fired if anyone found out I was gay. I would never be able to be married, and if I had children, they would not be protected equally in the same way as my straight brother and his marriage or his family would be protected. Uh, I could be kicked out of my home if a landlord found out I was LGBTQ. You know, and, and let's not even get started with how society would treat you outside of the law, right? How the medical community saw queer people when I realized who I was. You know, th they're the solutions uh, by mainstream medicine were to try and convert you which we now know the number one outcome of conversion therapy is suicide. And so I just came to feel in my bones, first witnessing my mother and then myself, that people ought to be treated fairly. Uh, is that radical? That, that difference ought not determine your destiny. That in fact, difference might be an advantage. That difference might be something we ought to look to in government, in politics, in business, in the arts, in science and research? Doesn't it just make sense to have a variety of, of, uh, of experience on any given problem in order to solve it or create it? So I just, my road to activism was the system was broken. It didn't work for my mother, it didn't work for me. And once you realize that, once you have that outsider perspective, looking at a system that doesn't work for you, you start to see all the other people it doesn't work for. Women, period, people of color, other people of disabilities, people who don't pray to the same God that the majority of the folks in their area pray to. And I start to wonder if we couldn't create a better system that would be better fulfill the promise of our constitution. In fact, outstrip, I think, even some of the intentions of the framers because I believe people of color are full citizens and human beings, unlike many of them. Could we do even better? Isn't that what America is? To continue to try and fulfill a promise we have not yet fulfilled. That's how I got into activism. And I think it's when it comes from that very, very personal place, whether it's your own narrative, your own story, or someone close to you, you can't let go. You won't let go, no matter how much your agents at CAA say, please go write another movie. You just can't make that all you're going to do in your life. Great, great. Um, Lance, what, what, what's the most important thing that you've ever fought for? Uh, I get a dozen donuts delivered to my house on my birthday. <laughs> it was hard, it was a hard fight. The, um, uh, I mean, I, so far, I mean, so far the biggest fight was for marriage equality. Um, and it, you know, that was, that was really just, that was the fight of my time. And I was in the right place at the right time to do something about it. Um, and, uh, and so far, I think it's the most consequential because we filed a case, even when many people, many fellow Democrats, many people in the LGBT movement said it was too soon. We went ahead with it. We demanded the full thing. And, and, and frankly, their criticism, criticisms made us work harder. Um, and, you know, with this idea that perhaps if we fought hard enough, if we demanded the full thing, if we didn't simply continue to request on our knees crumbs of equality, if we took it to the federal government, if we took it to the Supreme Court, where it might actually apply to the entire nation, um, you know, uh, I could see marriage equality within my lifetime. When many of the experts thought that wasn't possible, you know, I, most of the people who had been fighting that fight, bless them, thought it was a 25 to 30 year 
sort of journey still. And, uh, and so the, I think the fact that we were able to win that case means it's probably the most consequential thing I've been able to do, but I'm not sure it's going to be the most important thing. Uh, frankly, I continue to believe we want our rights out of order. Uh, I, I, I think as important as marriage equality is in protecting families, LGBTQ families, I think protections in the workplace and in your home so you can live and survive. That to me has always been number one for two reasons. One, so that you don't get fired for who you are. So you, you don't get married on Sunday and take the picture into work of you and your spouse, put it up and the your boss fires you. So that if your landlord finds out uh, your LG, B or T can't kick you out of the home, it's important. So that doesn't happen, but it's even more important because and I think it's going to get to this campaign that we're in right now. Narratives, sharing your story, sharing your passion about the issues and the candidates from a personal perspective is the greatest way to create change. Because by sharing that personal view of politics, you actually change a heart. And when you change that heart, that can change a mind. And frankly, a mind can be changed rather easily, but a heart can't. Once you move someone's heart to a position of more fairness and more equality, it almost never changes back. Now, if you are afraid you're going to be fired or kicked out of your home for being queer, you're probably going to live a bit of your life in the closet. It stifles narratives, it stifles story. And so I've always felt that that was one of the most important things uh, that we could fight for in the queer movement. And I couldn't be happier at the surprise, with the surprise decision from the Supreme Court that at least guarantees you can't be fired. I wanna see protections for folks uh, in their homes. I wanna see increasing protections for queer people so that yes, we're safe in our jobs and homes, but also we can tell our stories. And what an important year for LGBTQ people and beyond to be out and to tell our stories in places like Texas and Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and North Carolina and beyond to make sure that folks understand that really lives and livelihoods and self-esteems are at stake and that some of those are your own family and your own friends and your own neighbors. That'll be the power of narrative, folks. I hope people listening to this get out and share those stories. <laughs> Thanks, Lance. Yeah. Um, so getting on to the topic of this year's election, what do you see as the most critical issue in the 2020 election? I, I think that, uh, and it's a, it's a strange thing to say, but I think that the circumstances so many of us, all of us have found ourselves in with this pandemic, with the lockdown, uh, in missing our friends and families and, and all of the comforts uh, that come with being able to be out and outside and with people, it, a darkness descends. But you know, I, I, I found this in my life and I see it in history, in those sorts of dark moments, we're able to find moments and space and time to contemplate. And in that time, we're able to see a little fire inside of ourselves that you might not otherwise have seen. A spark, a connection to others, a deeper understanding of how we're connected to other people and how important it is to be connected to other people. I do not think that it is random that we are finally confronting racial inequality in a meaningful way in the United States of America during this pandemic. I, I think they're related. I think people have the time and the space to actually look themselves in the mirror and sometimes see racism they did not know exist, existed. To sometimes see how they benefited from a system that is unfair, benefited from a system that does not live up to the promise of our constitution. And we're starting to see that the system is broken and not just people of color who have seen it for a very long time and have been telling us for a very long time it's unfair and people haven't been listening, even very good people, even people that consider themselves progressive. And so I think the number one, I think we have 
a giant opportunity right now to begin the work to rebuild a system so that it looks more like the promise of America. That is going to mean breaking certain things down that we've always held close to our hearts, that we always thought true, and we realize are not, and are not fair, and are not true. Um, and, uh, but I, I think that this is a time of very big ideas. I think that we're going to start to understand that by not having a healthcare system that allows access to all, that we're really cheating some people more than others, that it's creating an incredibly unfair playing field in our world, that we're putting lives at stake, that sexism, misogyny, and racism play a big part in all of that, and we're going to need to fix it. I think that we clearly know that we have to fix policing in the United States of America. I think we understand and are coming to understand the relation between that and gun violence and all of the guns that are on our streets that really have no place in a peaceful nation. And so I, I, I think it is a time for very big ideas in order to do that in order to actually see progress again, which we haven't seen in a very long time because of how our system is built, it means we not only need to win back the White House, we need to hold the House of Representatives and win the Senate. We need all three. If we are going to push progress forward for everyone and fulfill the promise that all people are created equally, not just men and not just white men, we need those three things. And I, I, the really very, very good news is that I believe we have candidates, nominees at this point, presumptive nominees in place who will start to do that work uh, in the next four years to start to examine the system and rebuild. Now we just have to get them elected. Yeah. Indeed. Have to get them elected. And I will be focused per, in particular on uh, the White House and, and a handful of Senate seats. Yeah, terrific. So, um, so Lance, I think that you've done some work in the past with, with, with uh, Vice President Biden. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, you know, I, I've had the most uh, just wonderful uh, chance encounters and then some that weren't by chance. But I, you know, I, I'll tell you, uh, I, I was able to get to know him a little bit when I was writing the film J. Edgar. That, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, was in. Um, and I went to the White House to talk to some people who had actually had to, poor things, interact with and work with J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the head of the FBI, who was you know, closeted and uh, really violated the public trust in massive ways. Um, and who walked out of the West a door on the side of the West Wing as I'm going in was Joe Biden, Vice President of the United States of America at the time. And he, someone had told him what I was there to do and he grabbed me by the shoulders and rightly pointed out that he was one of the last sitting members, elected members who had actually had to contend with J. Edgar Hoover and in fact had gone head to head with him uh, on some issues when he was a young, young man who had just been elected. Um, and he took the time to, to, to tell me some stories and to give me his perspective. Now, this has gotta be one of the busiest man, men in the world. <laughs> And, and, and so the fact that he took that time, that it felt connected, um, it just didn't feel, I'll tell you, he just, it didn't feel like a politician. You know, uh, he never once asked that he be portrayed in film, <laughs> uh, which, you know, it just, there was no agenda. He just was like, I have some information most people don't, and I think you could benefit from it. And though people were pulling him here and there, he wanted to share. The second in time, was far more moving. Um, you know, and I've made no secret of the fact that I've supported other candidates on our way to where we are right now. Uh, and I still love and adore those candidates. Uh, I'll also say that I feel that we had a fantastic field of candidates. There's only one or two who I wish would have dropped out sooner. Um, but I thought it was a fantastic field. Um, and, uh, but as soon as it became clear that this was Joe Biden was going to be the nominee. I felt great comfort um, as an American, as a as a queer person, um, 
And that goes back to this moment um, in 2016, I believe. Uh, it was in the run up to the election. Oh, not 2016, I'm so sorry, 2012. I was about to make it. 2016 is stuck in my head for all the wrong reasons. Um, but in 2012, so in, in the, in the re-election campaign, he came to Mike Lombardo's house, who was a gay man with a family, uh, was head of HBO. I was there working and they invited a group of, uh, LGBTQ, uh, folks to the house to listen to Joe Biden speak. Now, just to put it into context, our, I was, you know, a part of the proposition eight case that was headed to the Supreme court. We had not heard from almost any official at the federal level to weigh in with support. Uh, certainly not the White House. Um, and, and so we, there was some frustration and there were big questions. And so at one point, uh, Vice President Biden was sitting on a stool in front of, I would say, a few dozen LGBT folks. And Chad Griffin, who would go on to run the human rights campaign, was bold enough to ask what I think many had said, don't go there. And he did. And he said, I want to know where you stand on marriage equality. And uh, I will never forget the next, I would say it was at least a minute, because it was one of the least um, rehearsed, non-political responses I've ever witnessed. It was complete silence. He sat there with himself, with his thoughts, no script, no talking points. And when he finally spoke again, he looked out, a little misty eyed as I'll get told in the story. And he saw Mike Lombardo and partner and their kids. And he did, he, he, I think, I can't quote it verbatim, but he said, knowing he was going to get ahead of the president and almost all of the federal government he said, I cannot sit here in this room and look at this couple and their family and say that they deserve any less respect or protection than a straight couple. And I am for marriage equality. No one had said those words yet. I know Joe Biden has not always been on the exact right side of history when it comes to LGBTQ issues. Neither have most of my heroes in the government. What I do know is that he paid attention and he listened and if this, if the LGBT movement is a movement to get converts, we ought to welcome them. And that moment when he took, without a script, got himself in trouble, which indeed he did, and got ahead of the most of the federal government to come out for marriage equality in a time when it mattered, that was bold, that's a convert, and he won my trust. And he, I think he asked for us to, to, to please be discreet for a few days before he could announce it publicly. But you know what, within a few days he did on national television that next weekend. And so, uh, you know, I, I've had other moments in passing where I've been able to shake his hand, but those were the two substantial moments. And uh, it just said loud and clear to me, we have a man who listens, who is willing to be moved, mm -hmm. who understands that the world changes and that he has to change with it that things need to change. You know, right now I, I, I am I'm inspired. I know there were other candidates who were already very progressive and ahead in many ways, but I also know that Joe Biden will listen and learn and adjust. And that if there's a system that needs rebuilding, he's not afraid to change it. That's what we need. Yeah. Um, just, just building on that, is, is there anything that Biden has done recently in light of all the multiple crises that we're currently tending with that really stands out to you that he's really shown through? Well, I mean, listen, I, 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 I think for, a, I'm gonna be very candid, for a lot of white folks, the most important thing you can do right now is listen and learn. And even if you think you know everything, listen and learn. And so, you know, uh, and, and if you have a platform and, you have a way of turning it over to some people of color, do it, right? This is a big learning opportunity. It's, it could be very exciting. You know, we're expanding the idea of what it means to be someone who America is proud of and loves and cherishes and protects 
because it hasn't been doing that to everybody for a really long time. So I, when I saw his reaction uh, to the George Floyd murder, um, which was to go and to, into a church to listen instead of speechifying, when you hear the phone calls and he does at least as much listening as he does talking, I go, well, there you go. That's what a leader has to do before they leave. Otherwise, they don't know where they're going. They're just in the dark. They're stuck in their ego. We've had enough of that. That does not lead you anywhere that serves everyone. And that's the job of the president. You know, if you want to lead with your ego, go have fun. Go buy your cars and take your vacations. You do not belong in the White House. And so when I see him doing things like that, it's very heartening. Um, you know, and when I see some of the better candidates we have running uh, for Senate, it's also heartening. And I hope they do as much, if not more of it. Um, um, do you have a favorite for, for the VP ticket? Is there anyone that you would like to see on the VP ticket? I think it should be Martha. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Martha's awesome. Oh, but we, had a, we had a really awesome time in uh, Philly. Uh, though it didn't turn out turn out how we hoped, uh, this will be different. Um, I I have, you know, I I have a few who people who I really love and admire. There's two who I have had the good fortune of knowing, um, and uh, you know I've met Elizabeth Warren several times, and I really admire her. Uh, I've said it before. You know, there's there are politicians who you see them on TV. And then, or in their commercials or debate stages, and then you meet them in real life, and they're not half as engaging or warm, um, not half as curious, which I think is probably the most important quality to have in a leader. Um, and Elizabeth Warren is the real deal. She's the same. I mean, just, I couldn't see any difference. Um, I will say closer than I have been able to be to her. I mean, Kamala Harris is someone who. Um, I had the good fortune of knowing because she was, uh, you know, the attorney general of the city of San Francisco when we were shooting milk and then the state. And uh, I, I had the opportunity to be, to, to be friendly she, uh, with her in those times and get to know her. And then again, she was critical in the fight for marriage equality. In fact, she was there the moment we won and began the mar marriages in California and married our plaintiffs there in San Francisco City Hall, which I'll never forget. Um, you know, she's tough as nails and also the real deal. I would like, I would love to have a woman of color who is tough as nails. And I'll quote Harvey Milk on, on this, as much as we value our allies and trust in our allies, when it comes down to it, because politics is about deal making. When it comes down to it, unless you have your own there, they may make compromises when it comes time to making a deal. If you have your own in office, that's why Harvey was like, you gotta let gay people, not uh, just straight allies. They will not compromise when it comes to themselves, their people. And so it'd be great to have, in my opinion, a woman of color. Uh, to make sure there's, we're no longer compromising when it comes to issues of gender and race. There's no space to compromise anymore. And I would love somebody in there. Sorry, Elizabeth Warren, but I would love somebody in there who it, it starts to appear as if we will uh, refuse to compromise uh, on anyone's right, no matter their gender or their, the color of their skin. That'd be great. So um, and there's also, you know, there's other candidates out there who also fit that bill. I just don't know them. Uh, so I'd be guessing. Okay. Thanks. So um, what would you be your advice uh, for Americans who might be feeling disenfranchised and disconnected from what's going on back in, uh, back in our own country? Well, it's tough, isn't it? Uh, because we're so far away. Um, I, you know, I, I feel disconnected as an American Texan. It's tough to watch what's happening and not be able to do anything about it. I, I tell Tom all the time, I just want to jump on a plane. You know, when the protests are going on, when the meetings are happening to come up with strategy, I just want to be in the room, as they said in Hamilton. <laughs> you want to be in there. Um, and we're far away. The, the truth of the matter is, though, as we're all learning in this pandemic, 
no one's far away from anybody anymore. You know, I mean, I, I, frankly, San Francisco, San Antonio, Philadelphia, Miami are closer than my corner store now. I can get there sooner. I can talk to my friends. You know, I, I and, and so you actually right now, the, the playing field has been leveled in that way. Uh, and, and I'll use just one example, and I'm sure there's far more, you know, technologically advanced ways of doing this and measuring this, but it's one example um, from our marriage equality fight, which is now like six, seven years old. Uh, it was a lot of people didn't know what they could do to help. So they didn't have the money to make the donations. If you do make the donations, right? Uh, so they thought, well, what can I do? And I, what we came up with was just the idea, uh, a very simple idea, which is pick 10 friends, family, neighbors, whoever, who you have their email address or their phone number and write them a personal email, 10 emails. It'll take you like 20, 30 minutes at the most and tell them, remind them to get a ballot. If they're living abroad, Robbie, Martha, Julia, where do they go? Where do they go? They go to, oh, I'm forgetting it. Vote for oh, abroad.org. Vote from abroad.org. If they're living abroad, I blew it. I had one job. I had <laughs> one job. Vote from abroad.org and, and, and register and get that ballot. Get it, get it, get it, get it. And to your other friends, remind them to get their ballot because it's probably a lot of people are going to be voting uh, from home. Vote. Voting by mail. And then I think as in as succinct a way as you can, because no one wants to read 20 paragraphs, just express why it is you feel we need Democrats in the White House, the Senate, and the House. What and not I, I as much as I love to get into the politics of it all and the law of it all, if you can make it personal, which I think right now we all can, yeah. everyone can. That person personal reason why you feel we'll be in a better place with Democrats in the House, Senate, and the White House. Share that. Share it in a few sentences. Share it in a paragraph. Don't be afraid to let your heart show. That will make a big difference. And by the way, if only one out of those 10 people step up and do it, you've doubled your voting power. Just one out of 10. And what we did in the marriage equality fight when we had people do that is, yes, it was a Supreme Court fight. Right? So there wasn't a vote, but we felt it was important that by the time we got to the Supreme Court, majority of Americans were behind a pro-LGBT decision. What we didn't want was a backlash. We also understood that though they're not supposed to, Supreme Court justices read the newspaper and, and television and are likely swayed by that. They do not live in a bubble. So we wanted to move the numbers and just that simple uh, this of storytelling and sharing, 10 people, and some other things that we did that we can talk about, moved the numbers. And you saw how by, when Proposition 8 passed, the vast majority of people, particularly in the South, did not approve of marriage equality. By the time we got to the Supreme Court, in every state, we had at least a slim majority for marriage equality. Well, it's the power of your own story. Share it. You're not powerless. In fact, you're more powerful right now than we usually are as Democrats living abroad. Yeah, thanks, Liz. I think that's really important because I think a lot of us think that the politicians are going to are going to lead us and go there first, but they really follow. It really we really saw with marriage equality and yeah. immigration equality, which we also worked on a lot as Democrats abroad for for same sex couples, is that it, you you really need to have that public opinion at fifty one percent, and then they will do it. They're looking it's for that lead. I I hate to say it, but and I won't name names, but I got into some really nasty fights with some, you know, it's, you're, by the way, you're going to get in fights with Democrats more than you ever are with Republicans. They don't want to talk to you. You're going to, it's about strategy, role, especially when we're re rebuilding a system, when we're fighting for civil rights, we are feeling our way through the dark, because guess what? We've never been to a completely equal place before. No one knows how exactly we'll get there. So there's a lot of disagreement on, on strategy. Do not depend on your politicians to be courageous. Our job is to make it easier for them to be courageous. Yeah. Now, we should vote for people who we think will don't need 60%. Right. We should vote for people who are gonna help us get to 51%. Uh, 
who are leaders who can help make the case with us. Uh, but yes, at the end of the day, I do believe it is the people who lead. I also liked what you said about how connected we are right now behind our screens in our houses and across the world, because it's said that we're in, in a time of great divisiveness yeah. um, and that it's the politics are very hyper-partisan at that time. Um, how do you see that we can unite and how can, we, how can we heal some of those divisions that people experience? Well, I mean, this has been a big part of my mission and work in life. Uh, if you read uh, my mom's book, uh, it's all about how we can build bridges. Um, the, you know, and I'm sure there's many, many ways to do it, but truly to me, in my experience, the most effective way to build a bridge is to have a conversation, ideally over a dinner table and a drink, but that's tough right now. Though I, I'm seeing a lot of people do these Zoom dinners. I've done one or two myself now. Um, but it is, frankly, not buying into the myth that's being peddled both on the right and the left, that we live in these very distinct worlds, these very distinct tribes, and that they're really, that they're somehow inherent, they're built into our DNA, which isn't true, uh, and, and that people cannot change, so don't bother, right? That it's war. That the, that, you know, my mother and I used to talk about it, that the, the highest plane of existence is how you define yourself, either as a Republican or a Democrat. Let me tell you, living abroad, you can see very clearly how absurd that is in places that have more than two political parties um, in particular. Um, but first, it's understanding that's not true. We're being sold a lie. Number two is then to take a courageous step, which, by the way, people will love for the most part, which is pick up the phone, send a text, make a phone call, set up a time for a video chat with someone in your family or an old friend who you think might be on the opposite side of the political aisle from you. Holy crap, that sounds scary, doesn't it? But it's what we used to do. You sort of didn't think about it because you just went to dinner with your family because politics wouldn't keep you from doing that you would have dinner around the dinner table with your family. You'd have family reunions. You wouldn't decide not to go because it was being held in Texarkana where most of that family is, you know, very deep Republican and voted for Trump. And like my cousin would have his toilet seat hammered to the side of his woodshed and you lift it up, it's Hillary Clinton underneath it, right? You would just not go. Well, you gotta go, you gotta go. And the, and the truth of the matter is right now it's actually easier. You don't have to get in a car or on a plane because you can't. You, you need to set up a little Skype date, a little Zoom date. FaceTime time. And I'm telling you, people right now are excited by that. We've all reconnected with someone in our lives who we thought we might never see again because we've got the time and the space to do it. Because all of a sudden, our only option to be social is this. So take advantage of it. It's a harder step than just writing to those 10 friends who you know are probably on your just convincing them to vote, which, by the way, is incredibly effective. This other step is harder. But boy, it pays dividends. And uh, you know, you're not always gonna win. You're gonna hear a lot of things that you don't want to. I will challenge you to listen more than you talk. And when you share stories, much like the letters, uh, in my mother's experience, because my mother was a master at helping people convert uh, to a more sort of accepting place, especially around LGBT issue. I try to do the same. If you go to the law, if you go to the politics, you go to the science, no matter how right you are, you're gonna lose. You're gonna dig the trench deeper. You're basically gonna be on a Zoom or a chat or at a dinner table, if you're lucky enough, recreating some terrible panel from some 24 hour news show. Don't do it. Do it from here, share a story. If you take the time, it'll take a minute at most to sit there and go, why do I want a democratic White House? Why do I want a democratic Senate? How does that feel for me? How's it gonna affect me? What will, I, what will I be able to see? And what will I not have to deal with anymore that's so distracting and terrible? Tell that story, you know? And that story, that personal story, you can't really fight it. You can't argue with it. And it, it has a tendency to change a heart. And, not always, but most of the time, you'll find out that that person who was gonna vote for someone else wasn't doing it because they hated you and your kind. They had their other reasons for voting. They just hadn't 
for the most part, not all, hadn't thought about you. They hadn't thought about how it affected you. And so it might change them. They might go, you know, okay, I'll, I guess I shouldn't worry so much about this tax issue I've got. If it means, you know, my cousin can't be about who he is at work or in his house. That's because that sucks. And they, you know, it creates that understanding. It doesn't always work. And there are times when, uh, you, well, I grew up Mormon, <laughs> not anymore, but the, the, they, we had, there was a term called dusting your heel when you finally realize that someone is never going to come around. And that'll happen. It's, I think it's quite rare, but it'll happen and move on. You don't have to get angry, just move on. Because a lot of people, I think most, most people have the ability, have a thing in them that our president doesn't right now, which is empathy. And they'll hear your story. Great. Um, if, if we could just go back to marriage equality, just actually for a second, um, which as of last week um, has been legal in, in the U.S. for five years. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a time where there isn't such a thing as normal. Do you think, despite it being a Supreme Court ruling, that this could be something that could be under threat in the near future? For example, if Trump were to win again, should, should we be taking anything for, anything for granted at this no. point? I mean, no, absolutely not. And, 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 you know, there are other ways that folks could start to chip away at uh, things like marriage equality, things like the recent Supreme Court case about employment, mm. uh, you know, they masked in language like religious freedom, freedom can be taken away. Uh, so, uh, you know, never underestimate the equality. They're very smart. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, nothing is permanent, particularly when it comes to minority rights and civil rights. Um, you know, I think Martin Luther King referred to it as an arc of history. Um, I've heard others refer to it as a pendulum. It ain't a straight line, folks. It isn't like, well, we're here and one day we'll be here and then we're done, great. No, it's, it, you have to be vigilant. It always has to be protected. Um, and, uh, I would say the greatest, most powerful way to protect progress for minorities is to lock arms with other minorities. Meaning if you're, you know, a white gay guy who thinks that, well, this Black Lives Matter thing, I get it, but it's not really me. So I'm gonna, you know, I'll read a little bit about it, but that's about it. Well, you just thrown your rights under the bus. And you don't understand the interconnectedness of minority rights. You better get out there. And frankly, I, I, I say, you know, one of the stories that was really heartening to me was listening to how some of these kids in Salt Lake City, Utah, where so much of my family comes from, Mormons, uh, were fighting for equality in that state. I mean, a very red state. Uh, in many ways, a church state. It's the state that had led the fight against marriage equality. And I asked them what they were trying to do. And they wanted to get an equal protections uh, law passed and they wanted to get the senior vote. And I was like, you guys are crazy um, and awesome. But they had this kind of milk coalition of the us's, Bayard Rustin, locked arms philosophy that, that ended up manifesting and then putting on a lot of rainbow gear a lot of queer sparkly gear and getting their snow shovels out and going to the seniors areas and homes uh, in, in the area, Salt Lake and down to Provo. And when it first snowed, shoveling driveways. Hmm. And it was just about visibility. Hmm. It wasn't a quid pro quo. It was literally saying as these seniors would come out and be like, thank you so much, you know, and it's Utah, so everyone's really nice to you. Uh, but they, you know, you know, thank you. So, it, it, what do you want? I, you know, I didn't order this. And they're like, no, no, no. We just want you to know that we're here for you as gay people. We're here to make sure seniors can get out of their driveway when it starts to snow. And I hope you understand that we're a part of your community. That's it. And guess what? Utah has some of the most progressive LGBT law in the nation now. It was the first red state who just this year had banned conversion therapy. It's that figuring out how to lock arms with other groups of people who aren't being treated well, who are minorities, 
like seniors. We forget about seniors far too often. Right? Racial minorities, put on your queer gear. I don't care if you are just the whitest guy on the planet and get out there with Black Lives Matter in any way that's safe for you. Right? Same for women's rights. Well, that's not a fair playing field yet. Um, because what happens when you create those coalitions, when you lock arms, when you stop being myopic about your own people's equality, which is hard to do because it hurts and you're hurting. Um, but when you can move past that myopia, you can create a coalition mm. that reaches past 51%, baby. And guess what? Then you can't even be beaten at the ballot box. That, that's power. Indeed. Um, going back to uh, Senate, and, and you mentioned that you were looking at some other races. Are there any races that you're watching very closely that you'd like to talk about a little bit? I mean, I, I, def I, I watch all this far too closely. If I had any advice, it's stop checking all the time. It doesn't actually change anything. You know what I mean? Like we all have our sites that have the polls and you're checking and reading and it actually, that doesn't do anything. You're wasting your time. Uh, if you want to do something, you know, sign up for phone banking, contact your political party uh, to see what you can do from where you are, right? There's so much you can do from abroad. I mean, from emailing and phone banking and. Uh, donating and, and volunteering. And I'm sure, you know, if you go to the website, you can find out all of that. Uh, that, that, that is, that's, that's a far better sort of thing to do. Yes, I check a lot. I'm obviously incredibly invested in getting that sociopath out of the White House. And I, I don't use that word lightly. Um, I've had the supreme displeasure of knowing some sociopaths in my life, uh, people I've wrote about who are diagnosed and I'm sorry, I think he has, he suffers from some of that. Um, and he needs to go, because that's not a good quality for someone who's supposed to care about a nation. Um, so that's number one. I, I think, you know, number two is, if you're really looking to take over the Senate, we, we have to run a lot of really smart campaigns in some, mm -hmm. some additionally tough areas. So yes, I am looking at places uh, like Montana which might be able to, to elect a, a senator. I'm looking at places like Maine, where I wouldn't mind uh, Susan Collins going after some of the things she's said and done. Um, I, you know, I'm looking at North Carolina. I'm looking at you know, some of these swing states where the Senate race is very, very, very close. And we have to win almost all of these competitive races in order to take a majority in the Senate. Uh, and so whether that's just sharing the word uh, or donating, raising money to make sure that those Senate campaigns are well-funded because as exciting as it'll be to have a Democrat in the White House, we want that Democrat to be empowered to actually create change. And in order for that to happen, we need the Senate as well as the House. Yeah, thanks for that, Lance. We actually had a very lively conversation last night among, among our European leadership about the Senate races and how they look now and how they might look in another month or so. So it's still quite fluid, but there's a lot of opportunity there, which is, uh, which is really terrific. Um, so, you know, we need to wind up, but thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time to dig into some questions that we really care a lot about and, and just to be with us as Americans abroad and that we can kind of share ideas um, about uh, what we can do for the election this year. Um, would you like to add a last word? I, I just, uh, you know, we sort of hit on it a little bit already, but I, I think that sometimes when we have an ocean between us and our home, uh, we feel powerless, but it's our home. I mean, it really is our home. I, I think for many of us living abroad, like there, that moment when you, when you land, and you get off the plane and you re recognize the sights and the smells and the accent, uh, there's just a sort of like, it, there's a sort of like, oh, I, I'm, in, I'm in my own space. I know this space, there's a comfort and it feels comforting in a way, you know, as exciting as it is, trust me, I like being abroad a lot. That's all very exciting, but there's just something about being back in the space where you were raised, we draw comfort. I would like it to feel like that again. Right now, well, not now, but before this pandemic began, when I landed back in the United States, my heart would break. Mm -hmm. 
the things I would see, the things I would hear, the trauma I would see in friends' eyes. In the, in the constant repetitive conversations about what's happening to our country. This is, this, it makes you ill. It makes you feel mentally ill. It distracts you from things that are truly important. Like what are you creating? How is your family? How are your kids? How are your friends? I wanna get back to home. I want us to be able to go home and to feel like it's home again. And the truth of the matter is you have an incredible amount of power to change that. And we've talked a little bit about what that is. Votefromabroad.org, get your dang ballot. <laughs> Vote. And that's not enough this year. If you wanna go home again and you want it to feel like home again, you reach out to those 10 people and you tell them from your heart why you want home to feel like home again for you and for more people who have never felt like it's home. You want them to have that feeling too. Share that. And yes, what we talked about right after that, if you have some family members who you know are gonna vote in a way that is gonna to continue to compromise equality in our nation, have the tough conversations. Do it with love, reach out from your heart, tell a story and see if you can't do that very difficult thing, which is to change a heart that changes a mind that gets you one more vote. Cause that's double baby. That's one less vote for them and one more vote for us. You have power from abroad, use it. Because it's about time for all of us Americans, both in the country and outside, to be able to feel like we are home again. It's time. Thank you, that was really, really beautiful and moving. Um, thank you, Lance, thank you, Robbie and Julia, and thanks everybody who joined us today. And um, I also really wanna especially thank you all for your donations today. There is still time to donate. And in fact, um, we have uh, two generous donors who will match your donations today, which will really help us do a lot of work to get out the vote. I'm gonna put the link in the chat box um, so you can do that. Um, but uh, really appreciate all the generosity today and hopefully we can bring some more uh, uh, some a little bit more funding in so we can do all of our phone banking and all the great work that we do as Democrats abroad to uh, to get out the vote uh, here. And um, as, as Lance already said, votefromabroad.org. Uh, please do share that um, in all of your networks and uh, make sure that you're signed up, that you've requested your ballot and, uh, and stay with us. And um, just to kind of uh, bounce off of the last thing that Lance shared, uh, you know, the power of sharing your story. You know, we've been doing a lot of events and webinars and all of that over the, over the Zoom in the last few months. And I sort of think I hear a workshop coming on, like how to share your story powerfully in, in one or two minutes. I think that might be something really wonderful that we could do because that's something that we do as Democrats abroad. We share about why healthcare matters to us. We share about why equality matters to us. Um, one of the issues that we're working on right now in the LGBTQ caucus um, is to get uh, parents, uh, same-sex parents who've had their kids that were born abroad who are sometimes being denied to get all of those stories because those stories, you know, we're talking to members of Congress, we're talking to senators and they want those stories. They really wanna hear about what's going on because, you know, that's not something that's happening for people who are living inside the United States where their kids are born on US soil, but is something that's really a, an effort to chip away at marriage equality. And that's, uh, that's something that we all care about. And, and if you're having trouble voting, if you have any issue with uh, getting, sending in your ballot request, getting um, your local election offices sending you information that's troubling or somewhat confusing, you know, let us know. Your stories help us make changes back home. We take your stories and we work on them from a story by story, state by state basis, and we can make change. So please let us know um, if you're having any issues, just get in touch with us about that. Thank you so much, Lance. Yeah, I have to say you're you incredibly having... inspiring uh, and your storytelling is wonderful and all the activism you've suggested were just, it was brilliant. It was oh, really you. fantastic to be on a call with you today. Yeah. Thank you guys. All right, have a good one. Let's go win this. Yes, <laughs> we're working on it. Thank you so much. Right. Bye. All right guys, I'm going to end the call. Ciao. Okay.